Every day, my dad starts training early in the morning. He does a bike ride, he has a swim, and goes for a run. He returns home with his daily surf of 10 weed picks. Then, he goes to train. Like every player, all week, the only thing on his mind is that Saturday, when the players take to the field, the siren sounds, and the umpire starts the match. That's when Dad really gets to show off his skills. By changing the score. The story of the Williamstown Cricket Ground, or Burbank Oval, as it's been known since 2004, goes back a long way. Williamstown is an inner western suburb of Melbourne. Burbank Oval is picturesquely situated by the bay. Originally inhabited by the Yalakut Willem tribe, the land was set aside for cricket and recreation in 1854. That was the same year that the MCG was opened. And a season before that, the Williamstown Cricket Club was formed. The ground's first pavilion was built in 1877 for 40 pounds. That same year, the playing field itself was declared a safety hazard, so local man Mr Lyons was asked to stop keeping his cows on the ground. Then in 1892, Williamstown played against an English side that included legendary cricketer W.G. Grace. The match was drawn due to rain. The biggest change in the ground was the construction of the grandstand. It cost £10,000 and was open to much fanfare in 1930. As you can see, they had a race to celebrate and there was once a running track here. The ground has seen many things. With this ground here, during the war the Americans were um, stationed on the ground. They had tents and everything full of quick American platoon was stationed on here and then when they left we used to have gym carners at the, the ground, the racing cars go around the, the, the ground and that and then the ground was also used for uh, baseball prior to the main then we had what they called the Harriers. They used to walk around. They had um, the Williamstown band used to play, brass band used to play at half time. This footage is from 1959 and you can see festivities are taking place. Once upon a time the annual Williamstown Parade finished up at the ground. The Williamstown Lacrosse Club used to play there too, but in 1910 they moved here to the nearby Garden Reserve, now called Farron Reserve. Williamstown Football Club did it the other way around. They were formed in 1864 and they used to play here at the Farron, but in 1888 they merged with South Williamstown Football Club, who were based at the cricket ground since their 1886 foundation. The grandstand is named the W.L. Floyd Pavilion in honour of Larry Floyd who was an influential figure for Williamstown. In 1935 he became club secretary at just 26. At the time they were last in the league. But Floyd changed things. Firstly he changed the club's nickname from the Villagers to the Seagulls. He also turned the club around and when he finally left in 1949 the Seagulls had won several premierships. They went on to win five more in the 50s, their golden era. Floyd's niece, Janet Dooley, is a life member of the club. She's been working in the kiosk for an amazing 56 years. Because he was involved, very involved, and that's what made us become involved too. And I could follow Carlton now because then he went to Carlton as well. And um, the grandstand's named after him, which you no doubt know. But, um, and my mum's a life member was, she's passed away, life member down there. My daughter's the youngest ever life member. So my husband's a life member, so the whole family's very involved. Mm. And have been for ever. <laughs> We're not sick. It is forever, this is my 56th year. And when did you start going to the Williamstown games? When I was about 10. <laughs> I used to go with my cousin. Mm. I travel all over Melbourne on the train, which I wouldn't do now. When I was about 15, a girlfriend and I decided we would offer ourselves to work for the club. We were selling raffle tickets for about the first uh, whatever years. We were too young to, to do anything decent. And then we just gradually 
I just went into the committee and started doing what I'm doing now. We've been doing that for too many years. You must have made a few friends over the years. Oh, a lot of friends, yeah, a lot of friends. And they, you keep them. You know, I go to the same all the away games with the same people and the coach and and uh, the same people help me all the time, so which is really good. Mm. Janet and Ronnie aren't the only ones with long time experience at the club. While Vin Maskell, current scoreboard keeper, has had this job for two seasons. He took over from old time and Noel Portingale. Noel kept the score for twenty seven years. Before Noel, Jeff Van Wingarden kept the score mostly in his teenage years. He grew up across the road from the ground, and in this footage you can see the grandstand in the background. Well, the first year, the first game of 1966, I was here before the game started, and the game had just, the ball had just been bounced, and I was just noticed there was no one up on the scoreboard. I wandered up there and started putting the numbers up, so it was as simple as that. And before the end of the game, some man came up and said, come in the secretary's office after the game and you'll get some pay. And also uh, we got offered a, a free hot dog every game, every home game. So that was it. And the pay, I think, was one dollar. I really enjoyed every moment of it, but at the end it sort of got a bit too old when you should be chasing girls, shouldn't be doing the scoreboard. In the early 70s, the club put up a concrete slab to put a kiosk on it. and Probably 1972 or 73 was possibly the windiest day in Williamstown of all time and it actually got blown against the fence. Not just that, the old ticket box, wooden ticket box, which is no longer there anymore, got blown down as well. And it actually would have killed someone if it had been people sheltering underneath it. The club's general manager, Brendan Curry, has another story about the old entrance when it was still standing. He says it was often used by fans of arch rivals Port Melbourne when they came across the Yarra by ferry. Hear the stories of the old people around around the club and how they played Port Melbourne in the 50s and the 60s, and they'd uh, get on the boat and travel over to Port Melbourne. And as soon as they, could, they stepped foot on on the land over Port Melbourne, the Port Melbourne crowd would be there, and they'd punch on all the way to the the ground, and uh, they'd throw rocks at each other. And so they then they'd stop fighting for two and a half hours while watch the game, and they'd leave the ground again to Port Melbourne. And the same thing would happen; they'd punch on all the way back till they got back on the boat. And so that'd be. So within later in the year when the Port Melbourne people come to Williamstown, they'd return the favour. And there must have been just ongoing street battles. This photo was taken in 1995, one of the worst seasons in Williamstown's rich history. The players may look happy, but they lost every match that season, and the club was broke. Brendan was one of those who helped save it from folding. Trevor Monty is the president of Williamstown Football Club, as well as a fan of Ned Kelly. He knows how to spin a yarn, well, uh, Ned Kelly arrived in Williamstown uh, on the 25th of June 1873. Uh, he was uh, transferred from Pentridge where he was serving a three-year jail sentence for horse dealing. He was here for a bit over six months. He spent the first three months on a hulk called the Sacramento, a prison hulk, which was situated a little bit up the uh, Yarra River. And uh, for the last three months of his sentence, he was allowed to move off the Hulk because he'd been of good behaviour while on the Hulk. In that three month period, because he was so close to the ground, uh, our records, which we've uncovered, uh, unearthed the fact that he played 11 games for Williamstown Reserves in the last part of the 1873 season. And in fact, when the uh, votes were counted for the best and fairest uh, for the reserves that year, he, he was on track to, uh, to win the, the medal for the best and fairest, except he got disqualified in the last game of the year for six weeks for headbutting the emergency umpire. In 1928, when this grandstand was being built and the foundations were being dug, we found, or the builders found, Ned Kelly's helmet. And that's a, it's very heavy, I'll just show you. It's a, weighed about 25 kilograms. And this, this is really, really heavy. But that's what he, he put on his shoulders and wore on his head uh, at the siege of Glen Rowan. While this is a great story, unfortunately there's no evidence to suggest that this is true. Soon Burbank Oval will undergo some big changes. We see the plans now, we get the architect's drawings and it's getting so close for us it's going to be very exciting to get a, uh, a facility upstairs, magnificent views of the, 
the Barry Ram Room, which is there now in a, in a very small example of what it's going to be when they get the magnificent panoramic views of the, the City Hopton Bay. It's going to be very exciting to get the whole ground revamped. And we just think it's going to be a just magnificent facility here at Williamstown for both the football and the career club. This redevelopment will cost about $7 million, a far cry from the £40 pavilion built in 1877. While everything will look different, in a way it will be the same. Because when it comes down to it, the club's history isn't just in its photos, trophies, club rooms or record books. The history is in the people. They'll keep the same old memories and tell the same old wonderful stories. Really, these people are what the club is all about.